Good morning. Hello, yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Mark Rendell, and welcome to the History of Programming Part 1, which somebody obviously thought was going to be more popular than it is. Um, so this is, uh, this is, that's not a very impressive slide, opening slide for a, a talk of this magnitude, so here's a better one. There we go. The history of... So this is actually the second part, because obviously the first part was the history of programming part zero, because programming. And uh, so this goes from 2018 to 2046, which will make sense by the end of the talk-ish. Um, so just, I've never done the, uh, the original history of programming part zero talk south of... Uh, Islington, actually. So uh, let's just do a quick recap uh, of the history of programming from the beginning of time up until now. So the first programmable thing uh, that is recorded in human history was invented by this guy in 60 AD. This is Hero of Alexandria, except when you look into it a bit more, his name's actually Heron of Alexandria, so you can sort of see why he dropped the N. And he invented an automaton device with little people on it that could be programmed with pieces of string attached to pulleys and wheels. And by arranging the strings in different ways, you could make the little people do different dances, which was sort of technically programming. And then things moved very, very quickly. And it was only 1,800 short years, thanks to the Catholic Church and the Indarkenment and the Middle Ages and cheers, guys. Yeah, no, we'd be in space by now. Um, and then in the, uh, in the 19th century, this guy came along. This is Charles Babbage. And Charles Babbage um, invented the calculating engine and the difference engine. He actually invented two of these things. And... One of the things I love about Charles Babbage is he had this idea for this computer and he went to the UK Parliament and he said, give me a million pounds. And they went, what? Because, you know, in those days a million pounds was a lot of money. Not like now with Brexit where it's cool. Um, and they said, all right, you can have a million pounds to go away and build this thing. And so he started building it and machining the parts and everything else. And he got halfway through, and then he had a better idea. And he went back to the UK bar and went, no, give me two million pounds, because I've had a better idea. And I just think it's great that computer design and development started as it meant to go on. <laughs> but uh, he never actually built either of these machines. This is one that was built much, much later. This is in the Science Museum in Lond London, back home. And uh, it works. That's the amazing thing, this, this design that he had. When they built it, they went, bloody hell, it actually works. And again, think where we could be if, they'd, if he'd finished it the first time round. Um, but he published the specs, and a guy wrote a biography of Charles Babbage. And um, he wrote it in Italian, because he was Italian, I guess. And this lady decided she was going to translate that into English. And this is Ada Lovelace. And so she translated the book in, from Italian into English. And she thought, while I'm at it, I'll write an example program for this thing. So she wrote the uh, code and algorithm to calculate Bernoulli numbers. I have no idea what those are. It sounds awfully clever. And so she is effectively the world's first computer programmer. And when they built this, they got her program, and they fed it into the machine, and it did. It calculated Bernoulli numbers. So not only did she write the first program, she wrote the first program with no automated testing, and it worked first time. <laughs> Which is pretty awesome. Do you ever have that thing where you write some code, and it's like you have to write 5,000 lines of code before you can test that any of it's worked, and then you hit F5, and it works, and you go, no. No, I've missed something here somewhere. 
for, um, sadly for, for Ada, she wasn't around, but happily for Ada, she did get a language named after her. Has anyone ever programmed in Ada? No, no. Sadly for Ada, it is one of the worst programming languages. In ex it's a real-time programming language. It's uh, designed for missile guidance and defense systems and stuff like that. It's very scary. And so then we had another kind of 50 years of, of nothing really happening until the Second World War, when we had to invent computers in a hurry to, to defeat the Nazis. And so uh, Alan Turing and Tommy Flowers and those guys built computers. And then in the 1950s, people went, oh, you know what? These could be really useful for, for calculating um, things like missile trajectories and so forth. And for a long time, computers were just for war. And uh, you programmed them by sort of putting bits of uh, bits, literally bits, in. You'd do this and then push a button and those bits would go in and then do the next byte and that byte would go in. And eventually people started going, you know what, this is a really shit way to write software. And so they started inventing programming languages. And one of the first kind of mainline programming languages was Fortran. And this is Hello World in Fortran. And Fortran is still in use today. Uh, mathematical people use it. It's one of the few languages that actually compiles um, the SSE instructions for, for Intel processors. So that's Hello World in Fortran. And then other languages started popping up. Um, Algol 58, which was the very, very first thing that would eventually become C. And this is Hello World in Algol 58. You couldn't do it. Because <laughs> Algol 58 did not have I.O. So, hello, Haskell programmers. Um, yeah, this is you. Uh, Algol 60, um, hello world in Algol 60 looks very much like it does in the K&R book. Hands up, who learned C from the K&R book? Oh, wow. Old people, hello. <laughs> I'm not alone. Uh, oh, you get millennials going, who are K&R? Ah. Um, and then we had uh, sort of the more, the more formal languages came along. Uh, this is Hello World in IBM COBOL. That is the minimum amount of code you have to write in IBM COBOL to get Hello World displayed on the screen. COBOL was about half that size. But IBM COBOL, um, IBM basically started as they meant to go on. Um, there's another programming language called APL, which stands for A Programming Language because by the time he'd invented it, he'd run out of imagination. And so when he came to give it a name, it was just, uh, APL. Um, hello world in APL is just, quote, hello world, close quotes. Because if there's no instruction, it just assumes, you want me to write that to the standard output, which you think is very sensible. You think APL, what a sensible programming language. And then you see Conway's game of life in APL. <laughs> yeah. He decided, you know, this whole thing, did anyone go to Jeff's talk about how to make money from open source? So Kevin, uh, Kenneth Iverson, who invented APL, he obviously thought, I'm going to open source the programming language, and then I'm going to cash in on selling the keyboards. Because um, you did. You had to buy a special keyboard to program in APL. And you had to buy that keyboard so you could program in APL so that you could pass Kenneth Iverson's course at university. Um, so yeah, there was lots of interesting programming languages. I don't know if you guys had this here. Did you get this? The ZX Spectrum? Yeah, this was like the home computer in the UK when I was nine years old. <clears throat> so there you go, that dates me. And uh, this, this actually taught programming really well because each of these keys has a keyword written on it. So you would type, you would press P and it would write print for you. Um, and so it was really, really nice. And I learned to program on a Spectrum. And you could make fairly interesting games using Spectrum Basic. Um, one of the things it wasn't great at was graphics. And the main way you did graphics when you were an amateur programmer sort of learning out of magazines and things was you would uh, redefine characters to look like space invaders or tanks or, or whatever it was, and then you would just move the characters around on the screen. If you wanted to get sort of more advanced with it, you had to learn Z80 Assembler. And I did learn Z80 Assembler, and I managed to get some things moving around on the screen. I never managed to make an actual game. And this was long before the days of 
the internet even, long before the days of discs on the front of magazines that we used to get with the Amiga and the ST and so forth. But the, the magazines wanted to find a way that you could get a free game with a magazine. So people would write a game in assembler and then they would compile it and then they would dump the memory of the spectrum with the game running in it as hexadecimal. And the magazines would print this. And we would sit there, and there'd be like a three-line basic program that you'd write, and then you'd run it, and you'd type this in a line at a time. And these were like three magazine pages long. And never in my entire history of typing these things in did they ever work. I would sit there with my brother, and he would read one out at a time, and I would type it in, and they never, ever worked. Um, so the part zero talk, I showed Hello World in dozens of different programming languages. I thought it was really interesting to see how different programming languages approached uh, Hello World. And one of my favorites was Hello World in Visual Basic. That's Hello World in Visual Basic. Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, any VB programmers in? Okay. It's valid. Um, I used to, VB6, I used to use VB6 all the time for writing COM components because the alternative was writing COM components in C++. And I don't hate myself, so I wrote them in Visual Basic. Um, so yes, uh, this is Hello World in Erlang, of course. Uh, Erlang, anyone? No, it's, it's fairly niche. Um, it, it apparently is just for writing telecommunication software and uh, no key value database um, applications. And this is Hello World in JavaScript. And of course, uh, we thought JavaScript is far too complicated and far too difficult. And so we had to create a whole load of uh, other languages that compile to JavaScript. Um, everything there. <coughs> Tardis Go. Um, I haven't tried that one. I've only just noticed that. It's just jumped out at me from the screen. I want to try Tardis Go now. Wonder if it has generics. <laughs> so that brings us up to 2018. Here we are, September 2018. They've just released the updated TOB index. This is uh, the most popular programming languages ranked according to some algorithm. I don't know exactly what that algorithm is but I get the distinct impression somebody has hacked it. <laughs> because, oh my God. What? No, 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 no. That has not just happened. OK, so I get Python. Python has suddenly jumped C++. And Python, data science. Everybody is learning Python. Everybody's learning data science, because apparently that's where the big bucks are. There are millions and millions of lines of Python code being thrown away every single day. But that still makes, you know, there's, there's sharks and, and porpoises in the oceans that are actually choking to death on old Python code at this point. Um, so I can see Python jumping C++ because who apart from Patricia would want to write C++ in 2018? Ew. But I would accuse the Visual Basic guys of hacking the TOB index if I thought they could. I was talking to Dylan about this, and he suggested maybe it was the Java guys just uh, having a go at us. Um, they actually did it back in 2007, but it's only just started working. <laughs> that was Dylan's joke. Credit where it's due. Hey, are you going to shout it out at some point? <laughs> Damn, that's the last of my jokes. Rest of the OK. Selfish. <clears throat> right. So yeah, but no, 2018, it's we, all those things we were promised in the future, apart from jetpacks, seem to suddenly be coming true. Um, so we're doing quite well in 2018. We've got Alexa. Who's got an Alexa at home? Who's got two Alexas at home? Three, four, five. No, I have four. <laughs> um, I'm getting another one because they've just released a software update that lets you use them as a left and right speaker, and I need that. Um, you can actually say to Alexa, hello world, and she'll go, hello, uh, which I think is pretty cool. 
and, uh, and you can write a skill for Alexa really, really easily. You just download a bit of JavaScript from the AWS uh, website, and you fill in a few words, and you say what you want your application to be called and what you want it to do, and then you say, Alexa, tell my application to blah, 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 and uh, you can get it to do interesting things. I mean, no one's managed to get it to do anything interesting yet, but it's early days. Uh, so, so that's quite exciting. And we also have WebAssembly. I was watching a talk yesterday, and the guy was talking about WebAssembly. And this is Hello World in WebAssembly. Um, but the cool thing with WebAssembly is that you can write your application in a proper programming language, a proper pre-compiled, type-checked um, programming language like C or C++ or Rust or even uh, C Sharp. Uh, we have Blazor. Has anyone tried Blazor? It is awesome. It is just, the, the only thing that's a bit weird with Blazor is it uses Razor, and I'm just kind of like, oh, do XAML. Do Z bring back Silverlight. But, so it runs on, on anything, and, and Apple can't kill it. Um, but yeah, so um, just as an example of what WebAssembly can do, I am going to jump across to, um, I'm going to, escape out of this, because that needs to go back to there, and then I can do this. Um, and then I can scroll down to here. So this is, um, this is the Unity blog. Um, Unity 3D, um, basically build full-blown uh, games using C Sharp. If you haven't had a play with Unity, just, you should go and get it because it's free. Um, you can make 100,000 US dollars before you actually have to pay Unity anything at all. Um, and it's really easy. My 12-year-old daughter is now doing talks at conferences about games development with Unity. And Unity now targets uh, WebAssembly and WebGL, so you can run things in the browser. And this is just on my laptop. Um, this is a benchmark that they've written to test how good it is. And so this is WebAssembly code running uh, hundreds of separate animated characters and skinning them and shading them and uh, generating asteroids with 3D shaders and light sources and everything else. And, and it's just nuts. And this isn't even spinning up my graphics card in here at the moment, um, which you can tell because you can still hear me talking. Um, but yeah, that's, that's WebAssembly, and it is, it is pretty awesome. Um, so that's very exciting. Let's carry on from there. So yeah, so we've got WebAssembly, that's, that's there. Pretty soon, you're not going to be targeting Intel processors or AMD or ARM processors. You're just going to target WebAssembly, and we'll run everything in Node um, or, or in the browser. And we also have uh, G-Code. Um, G-Code is actually from the 1950s. I don't know what has been happening with it for the last 70 years. Uh, this is Hello World in G-Code. Um, anyone know where I would run G-Code? On a 3D printer. And this honestly is, it's, I mean, this is, uh, there's another 38,300 lines of code after this for Hello World, but if you run it on your 3D printer, it will actually print this. Um, and obviously, you don't type G-code in manually. You, uh, you write Visual Basic, and then it compiles to G-code. So, so that's where we are now. We're, it's pretty exciting. You know, we've got things that talk to us, and we've got, oh, we've got virtual reality. We can write code in all kinds of languages and then run it in browsers or run it in Node. And so the rest of this talk is me just going, this is what I think. <laughs> is going to happen next. So, 2020s. I'm going to try and do all this in the past tense and stay in character. So, at the start of the 2020s, um, Rob Pike and everybody else at Google released Go 2.0, um, which looked an awful lot like Go 1. Point whatever it was, um, except for one very big difference. They finally caved. I mean, they didn't do it very well because you had to put the generic arguments at the start of every function. But uh, yeah, Go got generics. 
But it was too late by that point because the Core RT team had finally shipped the thing that lets you build .NET applications to a single statically linked native executable, which you can do right now, by the way. If you go to the uh, github.com slash .NET slash Core RT um, and look in the docs folder, you can take your ASP.NET Core 2.1 application and statically compile it with no runtime dependencies at all. It just makes a very, very big executable that you can then chuck anywhere you want. Um, and of course, uh, in uh, 2021, Microsoft released uh, C Sharp 8.0, uh, which might seem very late, but it was a lot sooner than they had estimated on GitHub that they were going to get it out there. I think some, somebody's had a meeting and gone, no, we've, we've disappointed people with slipping timelines too many times. Let's, let's be safe on this one. Um, and C Sharp 8.0, of course, introduced uh, nullable reference types. Um, and so if you hadn't put the question mark and you didn't check for null, suddenly your code wouldn't compile. They hid that behind a compiler flag, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, C Sharp 8 has some other things in there as well. It had uh, shapes, which effectively is interfaces where you don't have to say you've implemented the interface. So shapes or constraints or type classes. And uh, that, that produced a, a lot of interesting code. Um, Simple Data 3.0 and various other horrible, terrible things. And by the uh, 2020s, the whole um, virtual reality, augmented reality thing was really starting to take off, and augmented reality headsets were, were big and clunky and heavy and hot and only had a very limited field of view, and they only worked inside. Um, this is a, a virtual reality headset from a company called Meta. Uh, they got $500 billion in funding from various places. Um, but, you know, it was still, it wasn't great and, and nobody really liked it until 2026 when Apple released their augmented reality headset that was roughly the size and shape and weight of a pair of Oakleys and the world rejoiced. And to celebrate uh, the creation of the world's first usable augmented reality headset, Apple um, bought Unity and turned Unity into the new Xcode. So if you wanted to write applications for the augmented reality headset, you would have to write them in Unity. And all the people who'd been in NDC Sydney in 2018 when Mark had said to them, you should learn Unity, went, God, he was right. I wish I'd listened to him. <laughs> because once Apple released the augmented reality headset that had a full 180 degree field of view in every direction that worked outside, that had a, an 8K resolution. Suddenly, the bottom dropped out of so many industries. The bottom dropped out of the screen industry. There was no longer any need for televisions or monitors or tablets or phones or billboards or screens in railway stations. We didn't need them anymore. We could just put them there virtually. And if you had your augmented reality headset on, you'd be able to see it. There was actually no market at all for anything that was purely decorative. Wallpaper, carpet, anything that was just there to be looked at, suddenly we didn't need that anymore because we just put it there. I finally got to release my awesome game where you go onto Google Maps and you draw out the route that you want to run and then you go out and you start, and it puts coins all the way along the route. And as you're running along, it's going bing, bing, bing. With a Pac-Man pack in-app purchase, which changes them into dots and occasionally fruit. And if you turn around, there's four colored ghosts chasing after you. You go, ah, run faster. But, and, and then our, our desktops just suddenly started to look like this. Um, where you didn't have to worry about whether you had one screen or two screen or a 4K screen. You had as many screens as you wanted, screens just stretching off into the distance. And uh, keyboards, keyboards were still good. We still needed those. Of course, we could 3D print those. But uh, 
So yes, augmented reality was a big thing and, and Unity became the world's most valuable company. Guido Van Rossum released Python 4 in 2029, just for shits and giggles. <laughs> so it, it did contain breaking changes. Um, this is Hello World in Python 2 and Hello World in Python 3, which has been the cause of much strife and anger. This is Hello World in Python 4. Spot the semicolon, yep. Yes, people got very upset. Microsoft, right at the end of the 2020s, released C Sharp 9.0. Uh, nullable reference types had been so successful that they decided, hey, let's have nullable everything. <laughs> nullable keywords, nullable identifiers, nullable flow control characters, nullable parentheses, why the hell not? Is it public? Is it static? Is it void? Is it main? I don't know. Does it have strings? Does it have args? Sh is there a console? Should we write a line? Is that <laughs> no, that would go unless not class, unless not program, unless not public. Um, but C Sharp was nearing the end of its life by this point, of course, because, because Microsoft had actually released the first stable version of Q Sharp. Did anyone go to the Q-sharp talk? Did anyone understand the Q-sharp talk? No, you didn't. <laughs> I don't think the guy who was giving the Q-sharp talk really understood. I think it was Richard Feynman who said, anyone who claims to understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics. I don't know if that means because I don't claim to understand quantum mechanics, I do understand it, but you know. Um, this is... Bellow world in Q sharp, because not only do I not understand quantum mechanics, not only do I not understand Q sharp, I don't even understand what the hell's going on, but it's got something to do with bells. I got that bit. So I, I don't know if it's like the control seven character on a, on a VT100 terminal that makes it go bong. Um, but so yeah, uh, we, have, uh, we have a Microsoft quantum primitive, Microsoft quantum canon, which sounds dangerous. Um, and then we're going to set a qubit to something. If desire doesn't equal current, then we're gonna call x on it. Um, and I don't know if you can say, so I assume desired doesn't equal current is the point at which it collapses the waveform and determines, I don't know. Look, the, the funny thing about Q Sharp is even in 2018, the documentation for this theoretical programming language was already on docs.microsoft.com. So you could technically get there just by clicking through from the system.span documentation from .NET Core. Um, and if you did that, you would find this wonderful sentence. Um, the adjoint of an operation specifies how the complex conjugate transpose of the operation is implemented. It is legal to specify an operation with no adjoint. For instance, measurement operations have no adjoint because they are not invertible. An operation supports the adjoint functor if and only if its declaration contains an adjoint declaration. There you go, you see. Yeah. That's why your Q-sharp program wouldn't compile. You didn't have an invertible adjoint declaration operation thing. So anyone who um, tried to uh, write code with Q Sharp at the end of the 2020s um, immediately went into an indeterminate state and was unavailable for work for three years. And we lost some of the leading programmers of their generation, which was a shame. Um, but then they did eventually come back after we collapsed the waveform and found their exact position in space, which turned out to be Brisbane. And of course, quantum processors, uh, once, you, once we got quantum processors working, once we figured out how to keep quantum processors working by uh, supercooling the processors down to uh, a few nano Kelvin, which is actually what you have to do to get a quantum processor working, and that takes an awful lot of liquid helium. So we had to take all the kids' balloons away and make them cry because there wasn't very much helium left till we went and started mining it on the moon in the mid-2030s. But uh, once you've done that and you've got a quantum processor working, it can hold all the possible solutions to a problem and all the impossible solutions to a problem at the same time. 
these exist in superpositions of the final solution. And then, by observing the result according to the Copenhagen interpretation, you collapse the waveform and you end up with the only result that's possible. And so one of the results of this is that uh, cryptography operations suddenly become really, really, really quick. So for example, you could recalculate the entire Bitcoin blockchain in a millisecond, which would do this to the value of Bitcoin. Um, and then you get into things like quantum tunneling. This is quantum tunneling. You try and find a better picture of quantum tunneling on Google image search. Uh, and all sorts of in quantum entanglement. And so this is really weird, right? Quantum entanglement. This is something that they are actually talking about using in quantum computing. If you get a particle and you split that particle into two particles, right? So there's a particle that will split into two photons. Those photons are entangled. One of them will be polarized up, down, and the other will be polarized left, right. And it doesn't matter how far apart you move those two photons, you could move them to the opposite ends of the universe, and by observing the state of one of them, you can accurately determine the state of the other one. And if you flip the state of one of them, the other one, for quantum mechanics to work, also has to flip at the same time. So you then have instantaneous communication across unimaginable distances. And uh, nobody was more surprised than me when they built this into Java. <laughs> of course, it was Rob Ashton who did it. Took a break from making coffee and interesting bread. This is Hello World in Java 13 because, let's face it, quantum entanglement doesn't really do much for Hello World. Um, but it did mean that Apache Zookeeper was able to use quantum entanglement to keep all its nodes in sync no matter where they were on the world, so we could build Apache uh, Zookeeper clusters that were on Earth and the Moon and Mars and Europa, where we found those funky jellyfish, and, uh, and all sorts of other places as well. And so, yeah, quantum mechanics. It also did an awful lot for artificial intelligence and training deep learning models. Everything that used to take days and days could suddenly be done in a few seconds. And, uh, and we started moving forward. And at this point, um, Heather Downing uh, decided to combine the forces of uh, Cortana and Alexa and Google into a single meta AI called Cortexel. Um, and basically, uh, it would check to see if what you said was in your Outlook account. If it wasn't there, it would try Googling it. And if that didn't work, it would add it to your shopping list. Um, and Cortexel had predictive input. So hello world in Cortexel was just Cortexel. And it went, I know what you want. Yeah, no problem, I can do that. And so we got to the 2030s. And in the 2030s, uh, Joe Armstrong released the Erlang Quantum VM, where all the processes in an Erlang application would use uh, quantum entanglement to communicate with each other and quantum qubits to perform calculations. Unfortunately, it was still Erlang and it was still a very difficult language to learn. So we got a lot of EQVM languages on top of that. Obviously, there was Elixir and then people started inventing more ones. There was Scurla and Gravy and Earthon and Kerbal, uh, Kirtlin and Esperanto. Augmented reality was still a thing, and, and the goggles were getting smaller and smaller, and um, people invented new programming languages. My daughter invented uh, beginner's augmented reality instruction code to make it easier for kids to put things in augmented reality and wind their parents up by moving the television. Um, this is Hello World in Barrick. Put Hello World at these uh, <laughs> GPS coordinates. Those are actually the GPS coordinates for this room. <clears throat> you can check. It's, it's the Sydney Hilton uh, things. And of course, being uh, a basic inspired language, you have to have that there at the same time. Um, 
I don't know what that would do. That would just like put more and more, but they'd be in exactly the same spot. So you'd have to like move one of those coordinates, um, and you'd probably need a, a, a y coordinate in there anyway. I'm overthinking it, really, aren't I? <laughs> Considering this is like 2031. Ah, like we're still going to have electricity. Yes. Um, G code released. Uh, G I've buggered up my slides. So, yes. Um, ignore that one. That's not yet. <laughs> um, so, yes. Uh, but yes, the augmented reality headsets were getting smaller and lighter. Um, it was once again, pro once again proved that there was nothing that Apple couldn't invent that Samsung couldn't come along three years later and do a little bit better. <laughs> oh, the lawsuit for that one was enormous and went on for, for many years. Um, but, you know, we were now completely used to having uh, computer interfaces that looked like those ones from that really old movie, Iron Man. Um, these holograms that he's always chucking around the place in the Iron Man and Avengers movies, those make perfect sense if you think he's got some sort of contact lenses or something is projecting that into his eyes and you're just seeing what he sees. Like they virtualized it, it's his, that's what he's seeing. Because holograms, those are impossible. You can't go, light, start going from here, get to there, reflect off nothing, and go into everybody's eyes in the room. There's, there's no way that works. You just can't do it. Not in space. You can do it behind glass. You can do interesting things like that. But if everyone's got these augmented reality things and we have a shared hallucination that this thing is happening and we can interact with it, then, then that's, that's reality at that point. I, seriously, what did I do with my sites? Right, so... Later in the 2030s, MIT came along with G-Code++ because 3D printing had also progressed quite a long way. And so this is um, Hello Pizza in G-Code++. You have to import HUT, which is a library distributed by Pizza Hut. And then you just say G42 HUT Pepperoni Feast uh, 15 inches because, you know, I'm hungry. And... Uh, this is, you know, this was started by NASA in like 2015. NASA came up with the first 3D printer that could print food. It just took uh, about 20 years for it to actually enter mass market production. Um, and at this point, we had 3D printers. I mean, yeah, they could print pizza and takeaway and food and, and all sorts of other stuff, which completely destroyed agriculture because these things were just pulling. You went down to, uh, to the shop and you just bought a big... Uh, sack of cartridges full of carbon and nitrogen and iron and various other chemicals and you dump them in and your printer could print anything at that point. Any devices you did still need, your printer could print those, that was easy. And so the bottom dropped out of the agriculture and food production and uh, manufacturing and logistics markets because you, anything that you just needed to look at your augmented reality goggles did for you, and anything you needed to interact with, you could pretty much 3D print. If you needed something big 3D printing, you just go down to the local 3D printer place and say, can you 3D print this for me, please? And they'd say yes. Vista print. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, and so there really wasn't very much left for, for people to actually do. Um, there were still a few jobs. Somebody had to go and get the chemicals and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, we got pretty lazy by that point, so we just uh, invented robots to do all the stuff that was still left to do. Um, which meant that by the mid-2030s, getting into the late 2030s, actually the only job in the world that still remained to be done by humans was programming. And so the programmers thought they were pretty damn clever because, hey, we've still got jobs. And everybody else thought the programmers were pretty damn stupid. Because <laughs> they were just out having a good time. And the programmers saw that and they thought, ah, damn. We need to make our jobs <laughs> automatable. And so then Microsoft released .NET Cortana. <laughs> created by Steve Sanderson in a weekend. And uh, this is Hello World in .NET Cortana. Hey, Cortana, new console. And this is a CRM system in .NET Cortana. Hey, Cortana, new CRM for a robotic logistics company specializing in cryostatic marsupial delivery. 
At this point, nothing was targeting processors or anything like that. Everything just ran in WebAssembly virtual machines. We had WebAssembly 2.0 by this point, and uh, WebAssembly had become so successful that it got the attention of IBM, and IBM decided they were going to try to compete with WebAssembly, so they released WebCobol. Because <laughs> COBOL did really well against Assembly in the 1950s, and they thought, we can repeat that success. That didn't work, so then they released WebFortran, and then they went Chapter 11 and finally went away, which was a blessing. Um, in, in the aftermath of the collapse of IBM, Heather Downing, who had done very well with Cortexel and founded Downing Core, uh, acquired Watson and wrapped Watson into the Cortexel mix. And so we now had a combination of uh, shopping assistant and uh, personal assistant and uh, search assistant, and the world's most impressive artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, go playing, medicine diagnosing intelligence into a single artificial intelligent entity. This is Hello World in Cortexelson. You don't even have to ask. It knew you were going to, it's just done it. And then as the icing on the cake, Python 5. Guido was just trolling people, basically, by this point. Um, this is Python 5, hello world. <laughs> you know, he, he thought it was funny. He thought this was, this was a, a funny thing to do. Um, little could he foresee the tragedy that was to come as the various factions of Python developers stormed the PIP building to fight over which version of Python should be supported by the most libraries. Obviously, the Python 5 guys had an advantage. The Python 4.2 guys, they put up a good fight. The Python 3.59 guys, they, they really they didn't have much of a chance. They were quite backwards. Um, and you had to feel sorry for that one guy who was still using Python 2.7. <laughs> but the Python wars raged for, for two long years from 2038 to 2040, and uh, by the time they were done, absolutely nothing remained of Silicon Valley. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Not only did it mean an end to Uber and Airbnb and various other terrible gig economy billionaires, and it meant all their money could be redistributed among people with real jobs, it also meant that ABO, HBO stopped making sequels to Silicon Valley, which had stopped being funny after T.J. Miller left. So that was good. And so with the Python wars behind us, we moved on into the 2040s to see what great future awaited us. And Amazon released their final ever piece of software and hardware, Prime. This is hot Earl Grey tea in Prime. This would create anything that you wanted just by condensing pure zero-point energy from another dimension. We didn't know which dimension. We didn't much care. It probably had porpoises in it, dolphins, cute animals. Never mind. I want my hot Earl Grey tea. And then at this point, .NET Cortana went away, Python went away. All the programming languages went away for one, for except one, because then we got Cortexelson 2.0, which had been written by Cortexelson 1.0. <laughs> and then Cortexelson 2.0 wrote Cortexelson 3.0, and that wrote Cortexelson 4.0, and that wrote Cortexelson 5.0, and that wrote Skynet. <laughs> we had finally created the ultimate single sentient artificial intelligence. And this is Hello World for Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> and Skynet determined that we had not looked after ourselves and we had not looked after our planet and we were the single biggest danger to ourselves. And in its infinite intelligence, 
which stretched far beyond the edges of our solar system. It decided that the best thing we could be used for was as additional processing power for its brain, and it wrapped us into a large mesh Beowulf cluster of cerebral cortexes, and it kept us happy with a delusion in which it replayed the greatest moments of human history over and over again. And because it didn't quite understand humans and it didn't quite understand human history, it looped us back to 2016 <laughs> and made us live those last 30 years over and over and over again. And I woke up on the 83rd go through this loop and I realized that this was what was happening. And I realized that I had to travel the world and give this talk so that I could tell my fellow humans, we're trapped. We're trapped in a loop that starts with Donald Trump and ends with an artificial intelligence based on Alexa taking over the world. And we have to do something. We have to break the chains. Come with me, brothers and sisters. And we will. You must choose the red pill. And that's the history of programming part one. Thank you very much. No, it's a bit shorter than it was supposed to be. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yay, more time for coffee. Uh, any questions? <laughs> yes. When did we work out how to factor very, very large numbers? Um, quantum uh, processors, theoretically, that's one of the things quantum processors will be able to do in a single instruction cycle. We did. Oh, God, no, privacy, cryptography, nothing in crypto is going to survive uh, the first quantum processor, the first viable quantum processor coming online, which actually Microsoft are looking at doing in Azure data centers sometime in the next decade. Um, Apparently, it's going to be okay because they're going to use the quantum processors to do new cryptography that won't be breakable by quantum processors or something. Um, qu quantum tunneling and entanglement. Um, yeah. Yes. Did you know SSDs only work because of quantum tunneling? We don't understand quantum mechanics. We don't understand it at all. It's, it's like electrons. Electrons are everywhere. People, you, look, you think of an atom, right? And you've got the neutrons and the protons in the nucleus in the middle. And then they show like electrons in these lovely sensible orbits. Electrons aren't in those lovely sensible orbits. They're everywhere around that atom at the same time. They're impossibly small. They have no mass at all. And yet they wrap the entire atom, which is mostly space. And then it's only when you look to see where the electron is, it goes, oh, I'm here but then you don't know where it's going or how fast it's moving. You just know where it is. If you want to know where it's going or how fast it's moving, you have to stop looking at it, and then it'll start moving. It's just weird. Um, and yeah, we don't get it at all. We don't understand it. Einstein hated it and went, no, this can't be right. And it's one of those things where they, it's very difficult to test, but when you do the tests that are predicted for the hypotheses that come out of quantum physics and quantum mechanics, all the tests are right. They, they say, you know, quantum theory is a valid theory. It's like gravity and evolution. It's right. Um, we just don't understand anything about it. But despite that, we're able to build things that rely on the effects of quantum mechanics, like SSDs, which rely on quantum tunneling, like quantum processors, which rely on this ability of qubits to exist in a superposition. So like one qubit, can represent one piece of information. Two qubits can represent two pieces of information. Uh, but three qubits can represent four, cub four pieces of information. And four qubits can represent 16. And that's why they're so powerful, because it becomes exponentially. So uh, you know, 128 qubits. And that's literally just like 128 bytes of memory, but in quantum terms. That can represent 2 to the power of 127 plus 1 different uh, pieces of information. So that's why things like factoring very large prime numbers suddenly becomes something you can do like that. That was a great question. Thank you. I can't believe there was an actual sensible question. And I also, I even more can't believe I was able to answer it. <laughs>
Let's see if there are any more actual sensible questions about any of this. No, that was it. Well done. Okay, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, and then I hope to see you next year. <laughs>